Hello, and welcome to the latest presentation of the Rift Valley webinar series. My name is Martha Booker Johnson, and I am the host for today's talk. If you are participating in the live webinar, you can submit questions or comments in the chat module of the Zoom application at any time during the presentation, or ask a voice question by raising your hand once the presentation is complete. Today's speaker is Helen Eaton. Helen is a senior linguistics consultant with SIL Tanzania. Her research focuses on Sandawe, particularly grammar and discourse, Bantu languages, discourse, tense aspect mood, and orthography. Please join me in welcoming Helen as she gives her talk, Class Changing Derivation in Sandawe. Thanks very much. Uh, I'd like to explain first uh, the reason I've chosen this topic of class changing derivation. Um, the system seems to me to be particularly rich and it includes some typological peculiarities, which I think will be of interest. Um, for anyone not familiar with Sandawe, this map will hopefully situate the language geographically and also linguistically in the Rift Valley area for you. But I'm not going to give any further introduction to the language. I'm just going to dive straight into some data. So in this talk, I'm going to start by looking at nominalizers, and um, specifically agentive, instrumental, and action nominalizers. Action nominalization is the more complex system of these three types. Uh, there are several clitics and suffixes involved. And action nominalizations can also then be followed by postpositional clitics um, to fulfill various semantic functions, as we'll see. Uh, secondly, I like to talk about verbalizers. Um, as you can see here, some are restricted in the categories to which they attach and others are not. Um, there's also varying levels of productivity across the morphemes mentioned here. And then finally, I would just like to share a, a small amount of data on adjectivizers and how they relate to certain verb properties. So starting off with the nominalizers, the agentive nominalizer is illustrated in this table. It's uh, productive and it's suffix to verb stems to derive an agentive noun. So something like baloi, uh, shepherd or pastor from balo, meaning herd, or farei, liar from fare lie. So the e suffix um, is the nominalizer here. And the agentive noun created in this way can be marked as feminine by the addition of a third person feminine PGN morpheme from the low tone series. So we can see that in the female singer example, Rime Su. Um, there are also some different strategies for pluralizing the nouns. So one of them is shown by the parents example, Habai Sonso. Um, this involves the suffixation of a third person animate plural PGN morpheme uh, from the low tone series again. And in this example, uh, the noun is also marked as specific, so it receives a second uh, plural suffix from the same series. Uh, the third person inanimate plural PGN morpheme might also be used even for animate nouns. So as in the last two examples, rime wa and rime wai. Um, when this is the strategy, the agentive nominalizer morpheme may or may not occur, um, as you can see in the two examples. And it, it is a general feature of Sandawe that what I've termed inanimate plural morpheme may actually be used for animate reference, for example, in object marking, but the reverse is not possible. So the animate plural morpheme is only used for animate reference. And uh, the strategy illustrated by the final example is the same combination of morphemes, or at least um, homophonous, homophonous morphemes, uh, to, that can be attached to uh, a pronoun or a noun to create a plural possessive. So something like hapu, you, becomes hapu, wai, yours or your things. Um, a personal name is nam, so nam wai becomes nams or nams things. You can also do the same with an interrogative, so ho, who becomes ho, wai, whose, with a plural referent. So turning now to the instrumental nominalizer ing, uh, this is a productive suffix which attaches uh, to verbs as in these examples. So ge, um, climb becomes getting, 
something used for climbing, typically a ladder. Um, ame, hew, becomes ame ing, something to hew with, like an axe. And the verb stem to which the instrumental morpheme attaches can be reduplicated to uh, indicate a repeated action. So as in the last example, so da da ing is something regularly used for opening something such as a key, rather than something improvised as a one-off opener. And a morpheme which has the same form as the instrumental nominalizer and clearly a related function is the postpositional clitic ing. So as we can see in example one, and this clitic has an instrumental or accompanitive meaning and is glossed here as with. So bo humbo humbo cho ingo limo, um, then we spread it with uh, cow manure. So you can see this morpheme works at the phrase level. Uh, it attaches to the noun phrase humbo cho um, cow manure. And I don't have any data where in its deverbal nominalizing function, the ing attaches to a phrase such as a, a verb with an object. The only examples it's just attaching to the verb. Um, and I don't have any examples of both of these uses of this ing morpheme, if it's one morpheme or two is a question, attached to one constituent. So something like, I opened the door with the open with thing. Um, it would be interesting to see if that was possible. So the third type of nominalization I'd like to look at is action nominalization, where the action expressed by the verb stem is uh, made into a noun. So there are three main morphemes doing this, ong, o, and sa. Uh, the first and third of these uh, both nominalize um, both single verbs and verb phrases or even full clauses. So I'm analyzing them as clitics. Um, I'm transcribing the O as um, a suffix because this morpheme is less clearly used at a phrase level or above, as we'll see. So the argument for its clitic status is weaker, or at least it's, it's less clear. So the examples in the table um, illustrate each type. So the first ong uh, can attach to any verb. So we have an example here, dwe, meaning gather, becomes dwe ong, gathering. Uh, the second o uh, is restricted to a particular set of verbs. So these verbs tend to be transitive and tend to have a final e vowel, which is high toned and not part of the verb root. So something like time, um, which is transitive and has that A would be a good example. You can have Timo, um, but you have plenty of other verbs that could um, take this O like Bae, which is intransitive, um, and Hiba, weed, which is uh, has no A at the end, or Aki, uh, descend. So it's, it's only a, a slight tendency. Um, but there is one... Uh, one rule without exception, which is that monosyllabic verbs can't be nominalized with the O. And this makes sense because when the O is suffixed, it replaces the final vowel of the stem. So doing this to a monosyllabic stem would obviously just leave the in initial consonant from the lexical root. And attaching the O also has tonal effects. So the nominalized verb suff surfaces with all high tones. So ba-o from ba-e, low high. Um, so, uh, yeah, again, putting the O on a, on a monosyllable would, um, change too much of the, the root, um, for that to be possible. Uh, the third action nominalizer, sa, is, um, uh, marginally acceptable as a nominalizer without a following postposition. I don't have examples, um, of this kind of nominalization without the, the postposition. So time sa is an example I constructed myself um, and tested it on my language consultant. And he considered it marginally acceptable, definitely not natural or good Sandawe, but he didn't reject it out of hand. Um, with respect to choosing between the available options, it's common for the O morpheme to be used when it's possible with a particular verb stem, except if the verb is being nominalized with its object. So I have a nice example of this in two. Io hapuki no o shomo nani tue on majatime on. 
mother and as for you implied your job is grinding cultivating gathering vegetables and cooking food so there's four nominalizing morphemes the first two verbs are nominalized without any objects and as both are in the group of verbs that can take this o morpheme that's what's used so you have no and clomo um the second two verbs both have objects and they're both nominalized with the ong clitic. Uh, the first one, dwe, has a monosyllabic stem, so couldn't be nominalized with the o, regardless of whether there was an object there or not. Uh, but the second verb, time, could be timo. So it seems to um, often not be the nominalizing strategy chosen, this o, if there's an object, as there is it here. And this is one of the reasons um, I don't analyze O as a clitic in contrast to ong. Um, but there are some text examples where a verb uh, nominalized with O could be analyzed as being nominalized with its object, but they're not common. So example three is from the translation of the book of Genesis written in the community orthography. And from now on, if you don't see tone marking, you're looking at an orthographic transcription. I have data from different sources and I don't have tone transcription for all of them. So I hope that's not confusing. Um, so this example, China warange sina noko habo at se posen. Am I God, the one who prevented you having children? So here, noko habo. Uh, giving birth to children could perhaps be analyzed as a form of object incorporation. Um, the meaning is giving birth to children. Generally, there's no specific referent for the children. Um, in contrast, when ong or sa are used to nominalize more than just a verb, it's common to see constituents other than objects in the nominalization in contrast to the o. Um, you could get an adverb, for example. So here we've got Labana ie on po, you will get eternal life. Um, labana ie, um, to live eternally, um, is expressed by an adverb and a verb, and then nominalized with the on, and then functioning together as the object of the verb, always get. And in five, we see a finite clause containing a subject and an object nominalized by ong. So, waya hudinso mana a warange masia kinsei ong. The Jews knew that God would send a Messiah. So, the first clause has a subject, the Jews, and a verb, which contains object marking, and then a realis pronominal clitic agreeing with the subject. So, the third plural RPC agreeing with the Jews. Um, the object of the knowing is then the rest of the sentence um, that God would send a Messiah. And if you take the nominalizer off the second line of the example, you have a well-formed finite clause, uh, a complete sentence, Warange masia kinsei, God will send a Messiah. And the object marking in the verb send there is referring to the object Messiah. So there's a an SOV clause forming the object in the overall SVO sentence. So when the object is derived from a clause in this way, it typically occurs after the verb, perhaps because it is uh, weightier, it's a longer object in that case. Um, in other ways, structurally, though, it's the same as a single verb, which is nominalized and takes the object role in a sentence. So example six is this from a non-translated uh, folk story this time. And always, uh, and I have got satisfaction. So the noun satisfaction is derived from a verb by means of the morpheme o, and it's the object of the verb get. So the nominalization of a clause, um, as in five, is particularly common in the text I've access to when it's then further modified by a postpositional clitic and functions as a postpositional phrase rather than a nominal phrase um, in the sentence. So in such cases, the nominalizer uh, could be on or sa, and there are a variety of postpositions that can be used. So example seven contains the nominalizer on and the causal postposition kme, glossed as because. So ba oa giri kakasunswa kme on kmea. Then he waited there because the sun had gone down. 
So this combination of the on and the may um, expresses an action which has already taken place and has caused another action, in this case, the waiting. Um, as with the first example on the previous slide, it's a fully formed finite clause, which is nominalized. So here is the sun has gone down. Uh, it's finite because of the subject focus marker, the presence of which indicates that the clause is realis. Uh, in terms of tense and aspect marking, uh, the two clauses are the same, both the realis and there's no aspect marking strategy used. But the way they are combined, these, the two clauses are combined, shows that the sun goes down first and then and causes the waiting. So that's the function there of the onk me. Uh, in contrast, example eight uses the nominalizer sa plus the same causal postposition. Um, and the result is an expression of purpose or intention. So, heweka rogo asie, hewek noen ite saknea. And so he took a knife in order to slaughter his son, or because he intended to slaughter his son. So if we compare the two examples, um, we can see the similarity in how the nominalizer is followed by the postposition kme, and then by the realist pronominal clitic in agreement with the subject of the first clause, uh, which is what links the first clause to the second clause, or more accurately in this analysis to the nominalization of the second clause. Um, there is a crucial difference in the normalized clauses, though. So in 7b, as we saw, the subject focus marker shows that the clause is realis and finite, whereas in 8, we have hewek oweng kute. It's a non-finite clause. Uh, there's no subject marking. Um, it's describing an event which hasn't happened and thankfully doesn't happen. Uh, there are other postpositions which frequently occur with nominalizers. So nine gives an instance of the postposition na with the meaning of direction towards uh, glossed here as two. So hikiang, ringo, ringong, maeyo, chiatea, ta, umata, cheki ongna. It, in this case it's a raven, went circling around and around until the water had gone from the earth. So here we actually have an adjective, che, um, absent, being first made into a verb, che ki, um, and then into a noun with the ong, and then becoming part of the postpositional phrase with the attachment of the na clitic. So the rest of the postpositional phrase is a non-finite clause containing the, the noun water and the postpositional phrase in the earth, making the nominalized clause something like the going of the water in the earth, which becomes to the going of the water in the earth or until the going of the water in the earth. Um, example 10 shows how the meaning of the na post position changes when the nominalizer changes. So here we have the o nominalizer. One day we went hunting pigs or we went to hunt pigs. And this combination of nominalizer and postposition is used with a verb of locomotion. So here the go with a plural subject. Um, so it's for an action that takes place at a different location. And if the O nominalizer is not available before because the verb to be nominalized doesn't allow it, then the sa nominalizer would be used instead. And we can see this in 11. So hewe ma mang nanale mokola sana ni. He came to greet his friend squirrel. And here we have another verb of locomotion, this time the singular subject form of come. And if we compare uh, this example with the one from the previous slide, we can see the, the parallel structures both have a long postpositional phrase that's followed by a realis pronominal clitic. Uh, which shows the subject of the sentence and then a verb. So structurally, both are PP and then V, but within this postpositional phrase, there's a non finite clause of a verb and an object which has been nominalized. So far, we've seen uh, nominalizations with the causal postposition, kme, and also na, showing movement towards something. A third common postposition to see with nominalizations is which shows uh, location and is glossed in 12 as at. 
So uh, here we have Hegel, Barsat, Du, Barsat, Ak. This one came out first, um, more literally at the start. So the verb bara is normalized by sa and then followed by the postposition. Uh, this kind of temporal function for sa and and is common and can be used with any verb to show that two events are happening at the same time. So at the time of harvesting, we saw a leopard. At the time of cooking, the child fell over. You could use the structure for that. Another use of the postposition um, with, with a nominalizer can be seen in 13. So da pot e ich we ons. You can't do thus. Uh, the verb da seems to require this structure uh, based on the data I have, although this isn't something I've looked into very much. And at least one other verb requires the same, um, which you can see in 14. So me que bike boque ont, don't fail to tell him. So with the bike um, leave, or in this case, fail, um, we have the on and that's attached to the the tell verb. So let's turn now to the derivation of verbs. Um, this table shows some examples of verbs derived from modifiers. There are two adjectives, big and black, a quantifier, many, and an adverb outside. And the suffixation of the morpheme t uh, results in a verb with the meaning be or become the quality of the modifier. Um, the first two examples in the table only have the meaning become big or become uh, many because these verbs are derived from modifiers which are themselves derived from verbs. So ba'e means to be big and de means to be many. So then they're made into adjectives by the addition um, of te and then made into verbs with the t. Um, whereas the third and fourth examples in the table, they can really either mean be or become a uh, black or an outsider, depending on the context, um, as these modifiers aren't themselves derived from verbs. Um, the last example in the table um, is quite interesting. It's uh, the outside meaning in jaka is, is literal, but um, jaka ti is not to be outside, but to be an outsider. Another productive verbalizer is the suffix si, um, which derives verbs from nouns, as shown in the table. And in most cases, the derived verbs, the derived verb describes um, the quality expressed in the abstract noun. So something like cleverness and clever, or darkness and dark, and so on. Um, but the other mean there are other meanings possible, like um, the example of uh, the noun saw, and then the verb to break out in saws. And um, we can see some more examples of this kind of less transparent semantic relationship between the noun and a verb derived from it when we look at another suffix, um, or rather suffix combination, which can derive verbs from nouns. So siku, which uh, surfaces as suk, I'm analyzing here as a possessive morpheme followed by causative for reasons which relate more to its uh, use in deriving causative verbs from non-causative verbs. But here my examples are category changing derivations, or at least arguably so. And I say that because dwe is both a noun, night, and a verb, to be night, and a is both day and to be day. Um, as you can see in the table, some meanings are more straightforward causatives, like to make someone clever or to unify but the others are perhaps less transparent in their meaning. Another verbalizing morpheme, which can also be um, attached to verbs as well as to non-verbs is mse. Um, when it attaches to verbs, it has a desiderative function. So qua, return, becomes qua mse, I want to return. Um, I only have one text example of this morpheme used on a non-verb, and that's the example here in 15. So, a tria rokonso heso iom sea kong a roe. Then Dick Dick's children open the house thinking it was their mother. So the use of the narrative connective morpheme at the end of the first line shows that their mother is syntactically a verb in this uh, sentence. And it has the meaning, think it was their mother. 
And according to my language consultant, this is productive. We can do this to other nouns, but I've only ever caught one example in the wild in a text. Uh, a final set of morphemes used to derive verbs. Um, they all, in all include some form of gi, either high-toned or low-toned, um, and in one case with preceding floating nasalization, as we can see here. So the noun mama, friend, becomes the verb mamanki, be friends. Chang, oil or fat, becomes junk, um, to be fat. And then we have an example. We've already seen the che, absent, becoming um, cheki, be finished, or ita, um, far, being verbalized to be be long, itaki. Um, the two high tone suffixes in this group are also found attached to verbs. So you can see this now in the last four rows of the table. They have a reciprocal function. So hukwa, kill, becomes hukwaki, uh, kill each other, and so on. And this reciprocity can also be seen in the first example. So um, be friends is to be friends with each other. Um, Arguably also in the example um, itanki, you could say that to be far from each other, therefore means to be long. Um, the last two examples in the table also include a pluriactional morpheme wa before the floating nasalization and then the high-toned ki of the reciprocal suffix. Finally, I just got a small amount of data on adjectivizers. Um, Sandawe doesn't have many underived adjectives. Um, I have 17 recorded in my corpus, but there is a productive way of making adjectives from intransitive verbs, which is by adding the suffix te, uh, as we can see here in the table. So the verb bae, be big, becomes bae te, big or very big, and so on. And sometimes the resulting adjective seems to have an intensified meaning, very big rather than just big. But it's not clear to me whether that is simply context dependent um, or not. Some examples have suggested that if there's an underived adjective with an equivalent meaning, so for example, there is an underived adjective, me, meaning big, then the form derived with the te is understood as intensified. And if there isn't uh, a comparable underived adjective, then either meaning is possible. I also have three examples of intransitive verbs which are adjectivized by a different suffix, do, um, as shown in the last three rows of the table. So something like oe, be narrow becomes oe, do, narrow. Um, these don't get interpreted with this intensified meaning, and there are only three examples that I found. Finally, there's a productive process which derives an adjective from a verb containing object marking, as we can see here. So, hukwa, uh, kill, containing the third person masculine singular object, once suffixed with do, functions as an adjective killed, um, and then takes adjective agreement endings um, in the normal way according to what it modifies. Uh, the last example here shows how the object marking could be for a plural object. So wado um, has a plural object and then uh, therefore would modify a plural referent. And these could also be analyzed as past participles. So this is a summary table of the morphemes we've looked at. I think for me, the area I find most interesting is the action nominalizers and especially their use in linking clauses, um, showing intention, cause, and so on. I find it very interesting how you get combinations of these suffixes in sentences. So you get a verb made into an adjective and then normalized as part of a larger phrase and then ends up with a postpositional clitic in order to fulfill a particular role in the sentence. And some of the morphemes listed here also have other uses in the grammar, and it would be very interesting to research um, further these morphemes and, and be more sure what the best analysis would be, um, such as the agentive morpheme. Is it the same as what I've elsewhere analyzed as a pronominal morpheme in other contexts? Um, the on action nominalization uh, nominalizer is very common. Um, there's a, a morpheme of at least the same form, possibly the same type, which indicates location. 
So how do, how do those two relate? So these would be areas for further research. Uh, that's all I have to share for now, though. Um, there are others who have looked at these morphemes, many of them before me. So um, I'd like to draw your attention to these suggestions for further reading if you're interested. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for your presentation. We can now begin the question and answer section. The Tom, Tom has a question. Um, thanks a lot for this very uh, interesting and, and uh, full talk. I have uh, two questions. Um, <clears throat> first, I was wondering uh, about this element mse, which you translate as thinking that, uh, what the evidence is that this is uh, really verbalizing, or I, I was wondering whether uh, an interpretation in terms uh, of as if or something like that uh, would also be possible. I, I mean, that it is a ver verb is not obvious to me. That's one question. And another one, could you say something, possibly I misunderstood at the very beginning, the, I think with the E, which combines with inanimates, the agent divisor, could you explain what an inanimate agent noun would be? Or I missed it, misunderstood you, but in any case. Okay. Yeah, no problem. I probably didn't explain that one well, but just starting with where the, the slide I'm at, the reason that I'm considering that um, a verbalizer is because of the uh, narrative connective morpheme, the a uh, on iom sea. So that narrative connective morpheme a, uh, um, it's not, it doesn't have any subject marking. It is just normally used to join two verbs. So the fact that it's on that is why I consider it a verb. There isn't really another good reason. I mean, obviously it sort of works out in English translation to sound like a verb, but that's the reason I'm analyzing it as a verb because I think I have one example where it seems to join an idiot phone to another verb, but in general, this is just um, a morpheme that joins two verbs. So in the structure of the overall sentence with the subject marking and that morpheme, that's why I'd consider that um, making it into a, um, a verb. Um, and then just go right back to the beginning. The What I found interesting was, um, yeah, so the, the, the glottal stop wa in the last two examples, the singer's examples, normally that's um, a morpheme used with inanimate plurals rather than animate plurals. And you get the so that's in the parents um, for animates. Um, but uh, it's, still, it's still meant singers are, are still people. They are still <clears throat> meant to be animates. Um, but what I've generally found um, is that you can you can't use animate morphemes for inanimates, but the inanimate morphemes maybe it's not always the best word because you do see them sometimes used for animates, and if you do, then you there are sometimes some other consequences for the the subject marking or the other morphemes. Um, but yeah, but you can in in using the agentive you can have sometimes the animate plural, sometimes the inanimate plural morphemes, but the the actual examples are animates. I hope that explains it, things and didn't make it worse. I mean, just a question, is the function of that uh, uh, pluralization uh, as opposed to the E, which is singular? The E is just an agent divisor. And so the 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 wa is is making it the plural. That's why it's understood as singers That's rather right. than singer. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And it's before before the agent of. Yeah. Thank you. But it could it could be it could be the example I didn't write down, but I just said the when you say hapu, which is hu, um you, and then you say hapu wai that that's sort of yours as in your things so the plural then is not the you the you is singular but the plural is for the things you're referring to so um yeah it's a it's got a it, it gets used a lot that morpheme for for different kinds of plural yeah yeah um, martin can i ask you uh, these um, these uh, normalizations they uh, i think some of them uh, they are uh, 
uh, they, they have specialized uh, meanings, they are lexicalized. Are there differences across the nominalizations in whether they, uh, they, they allow specialization, they allow, as, and specifically this own, do you ever see uh, lexicalization or specialized meaning with the, with the clitic own? I don't think so. Um, I think these ones are always very, the ong, the o, and the sa are always very much a sum of their parts, um, yeah. what you would expect. Yeah, I don't think I've come across um, anything else. The ong is the one that I, I just, I don't know sometimes what to label that because it's used so much in, um, in narratives, for example. And Sometimes it has a locational meaning. Um, sometimes it translates best to that. So sort of I knew that this had happened. Um, so I, I'm really unsure what to call that on sometimes. Um, I think one of the examples I had, um, let me see if I can find it now. Um, yeah, even in the in the translation, the Jews knew that God would send. That's the most natural translation of that. Um, is it really the Jews knew the sending of the God sending of the Messiah? I mean, is it really doing the same job, nominalizing or not? I don't know. In some respects, it reminds me about uh, of a very multifunctional O in Iraqu, which uh, yeah indicates uh, uh, it can it can be used on on a noun, but also on a clause. Um, oh wow! Uh, yeah, yeah. So that that is one similarity in behavior, and it and it gives sort of um, the the thing. The, the stretch about which something is said. So it has also a very, uh, 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 yeah, syntactic function. Mm. Yeah, not, I think- Not, um, not really the same, but it reminds me about it as a, as yeah. a maybe a wider function than only nominalizing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and that's it. I mean, I'm looking, I'm calling some things nominalized and verbalized based on how they function in the overall sentence. But I think there's another, there are other ways to analyze them, um, which you would end up with different decisions, I think. Um, yeah. Yes. Thank you very much, Helen. Very good talk. Hi. Yes, these E, which you have, we have in front of us now in uh, Kinsey. Uh, I always think of those as a three third person mark making the whole thing a nominal. Which is something which you just suggested. Mm, okay. Uh, yeah. So that's yeah. nominalizer um, as such, yes. And the um, verbalizer C, low tone. Mm. Um, I'm mm -hmm. often wondering whether that is in some way connected with the high toned C. I don't know what you call that in your analysis. And the thing that says, you um, know, having something or other. Possessive, usually, but the one that's in the scene. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm just wondering yeah. whether that is a low tone version, specifically used with verbs, of the same morphine. Yeah. That, and I mean, yeah. th this sort of thing is very interesting. I've, you know, it's one of the things I would have loved to have followed up, but it didn't. But, uh, you know, all over the place also in uh, Quay, you've got formatives with the uh, s in them, with a similar thing, and adverb, adverb falling, adverb forming. I know it's a right. sort of difficult matter, and we're a long way, a long way away from the original um, starting point, and therefore things have got very well. I, I hesitate to say corrupted, but they've become differentiated, and therefore the use doesn't necessarily tell you the origin. Uh, yes, yeah. I think main comment, but thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I one of the 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 hard things is just you can't break these things apart anymore. So I'm I'm sort of making an assumption that this this souk has come from the sik sik. It's very hard with voiceless vowels to to say say these morphemes out loud. Um, but um, yeah, the, this is the what I would um, analyze as a possessive and um, the c. And that it is also interesting to me just how many, considering how many consonants, this is a very um, non-technical way of looking at it, but considering how many consonants there are available 
to us and our speaker for um, for constructing more feeds. It amazes me how often you see the same ones. Um, you have a high tone C and a low tone and a high tone C and a low tone and so on. So is that coincidence? But are some of them just related and we haven't seen the intermediate stages to be able to prove they're related? I don't know. I'm hesitating, but I have a, a question that has nothing to do with your talk. But the That's okay. From science, so uh, I was uh, discussing with Roland, Roland Kiesling, uh, uh, last weekend, um, the yeah. latch stories uh, that we have uh, among the Iraqi, uh, a trickster, horrible guy. And um, it's all, sometimes he's called lie. And so I wondered whether uh, that is uh, the lie, I guess, lie is the, the hair in the Sandawa, is that correct? Uh, lie, yeah. Lie, the hair. Uh, do you have do you have these stories? Uh, I saw a few stories coming uh, around here. Do you have the story of uh, about the hair? And if it's one of them, the story about this, this trickster who gets more and more by claiming that his gifts should be paid. Ooh. I don't remember that. I think okay. I would remember, but, but do you have yeah, we have a hair in the in the, the um, a few, yeah, a few. a few. Not not as many as you might think, but um, possibly just because we didn't collect that many. Um, but we have a few, definitely. Thank you. I think those are all of the questions and comments for today. I'd like to take this opportunity to remind everyone that recordings of all of the presentations in the Rift Valley webinar series can be found on the Rift Valley Network YouTube page and entries for each presentation are added to the Rift Valley bibliography. I would like to thank Helen again for her presentation and everyone else for participating today and I hope to see you again at our next webinar on Wednesday the 18th of October entitled A Proposed New East African Cladelet Langi Chaga Dawida Sagala by Derek Nurse.